Once upon a time, there were people in this place. My name is Tom Izu. I'm with the director of the California History Center at Danza College, and I'm also uh, a volunteer with the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. Um, for quite some time, I've been concerned about uh, capturing the history of Sansei for the San Jose area. And as you know, we're all getting a lot older, um, but I'm also concerned that a lot of the history and experience will be lost. And I think it's very, very key for our community to understand the role the Sansei played at a very critical time, which has gone on to influence a lot of the things that are happening right now in our community, and most likely will affect the future as well. So for a museum like the Japanese American Museum, I think it's important to do these kind of all history interviews. And <clears throat> one thing um, from talking to individuals like Steve and Roy and other people here, I understand that there was a lot of things going on in the 1970s, especially connected to music. And I always thought that a lot of you have already talked to people. You're all you know, very prominent and active in many circles. And so you've already told the story many times. But I, I came to the realization that a, a lot of you have not necessarily had the chance to reflect on some of the parts of this history because it's not part of the end product, the end product being whatever you're doing right now. And it's not any different than how uh, a lot of us dealt with the Nisei and Issei. You know, we only captured a certain part of their history. And I feel very badly because a lot of them did not have a chance to really reflect on that history much. And to some extent, the Sanseis made history up for them, which isn't always the best thing. So. What I'd like to do today is, is an effort to get people a chance to reflect back on that time period, and especially music and culture in the San Jose area in the 1970s. And we started this as an oral history project, really. Um, but Dwayne Kubo here uh, had done an interview with the Asians for Community Action, an activist group of Sansei in the 1970s. And the method he used was to do a panel of people all together and talk because it allows them to hear each other and they start remembering things. Um, so we decided to try the same thing today. And this is just the beginning because there's a lot of things I realize I just don't know anything about what you all did. Um, I know some of you have told me stories and you don't have to repeat them today um, about things you did when you were younger, but that's okay. Um, the point is just to get you to think about what happened and to start talking to each other. And after this, we'll talk a little bit later but after this, I want to discuss other projects you might have, and as well as people in our audience. <clears throat> so let me tell you how the process will work. I have, um, I'm going to start off with you introducing yourself and saying a little bit about yourselves. And then I have these three other sections, and I'll have questions. And not, you don't have to answer every single question. So which one, whichever one you want to answer. And then if other people here on this panel have a comment to make, then please feel free to do it. It's just to get you guys <coughs> And um, I'm going to try to watch the time because I know once you guys get going we'll probably go on forever knowing most of you <laughs> <laughs> but you got a lot of stories to tell that's kind of the whole point point. and at each of the end of each section I'm going to have the audience behind me here if they have comments or questions they'd like to make then they should feel free to chime in mm -hmm. the point is to get everybody thinking and discussing so there's a lot of things I probably will not get to cover because we just don't have enough time and there's probably things you'd really like to say but that's at the end we can talk about how we can add things in later in some other interview projects or whatever else you have in mind. Um, <clears throat> so my goal is to uh, have um, um, this recorded and then later transcribed. And it's going to go in the archives of the California History Center and also the archives of the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. So the first thing I'm going to do, though, is have a very special guest say a few words. And that's Minoru Kanda, all the way from Japan writer, researcher, some of you already know him because I understand he's involved in a lot of things. But one thing I know is that he's been really interested in Asian American music and culture. And hey, he came all the way out here, so we better let him say something. And so if, <laughs> we know, uh, if you would like to come up here and we want to count. Yeah. Um, uh, first off, I'm very honored to be here with you all. And um, um, well, I'm Japanese. Uh, but my grandma was born in Hawaii, as I say. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I was born and raised in Japan, so I'm not the Yonsei, you know. <laughs> 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 but um, some people in Japan told me, uh, and uh, Minoru 
if you want to be Japanese American, no, no I'm, not, I'm not. I'm Japanese American in Japan. You know, this is my joke. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, first off, I, I um, got uh, the reason why I, I, I'm here is four years ago, uh, the next year of the tsunami and earthquake hit the whole area. Uh, Steve Yamaguma uh, came all the way from San Jose to Tokyo as a special guest speaker for my presentation on Yokohama, California, mm -hmm. uh, as an academic seminar uh, in Tokyo. Uh, and um, so, uh, Steve did a good job, and uh, I thank you, Steve, <laughs> for your um, cooperation. And um, and and I was working on uh, translation as well as the Japanese liner notes for the re release of Yokohama uh, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I knew PJ and <laughs> I met, I met them in Kyoto, Japan, <laughs> several years ago. So um, that's, that's why I, I'm here. But uh, the Tom gave me a copy of the regime for today. And uh, maybe I have to speak about the 70s. So the, I, maybe y if you give a few minutes, I'd like to talk about the 70s in Japan. And the Asian American kind of things in Japan in 70s, maybe 80s. Um, actually, uh, I, I, you don't know much about how the Asian American culture was accepted or not accepted in Japan and Japanese people. So I think I am a person who tell you about it. Yeah. And uh, please understand, I'm uh, very unique. No, normally, uh, Japanese people don't know much about Japanese Americans or Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, I have relatives in Hawaii, even in Arizona, and Watsonville. The day after tomorrow, I have to go to Watsonville <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to stay overnight at the relatives' home. Yeah. That's all for now. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Peter Horikoshi, uh, and uh, was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts because uh, my family moved back east after World War II from the camps. Uh, but I grew up in uh, Sac Sacramento in the Florin area, uh, which is referenced in one of the songs from the Yokohama, California album. Uh, <coughs> I was a member of Yokohama, California, um, and we can talk more about that later, but um, uh, we all uh, had a good time and were the second Asian American group uh, to produce a record album in the 70s. Uh, and uh, let's see, I was also involved in Asian American Studies at UC Berkeley, uh, along with PJ, that she likes to re remind me of. And uh, we, we had some uh, very meaningful things going on back then. Um, we also started getting involved in community work, uh, specifically with the East Bay in the East Bay area. And Roy and PJ and I were amongst the founding members of a group that later became known as the East Bay Japanese for Action and is now known as j uh, And just walking around J-Town today here, uh, it, it, you know, you, you see kind of the, the outcome of some of the efforts that, that we, we were part of uh, in the 70s. Uh, my name is Keith Inoue. Um I was born and raised here in the San Jose area. So Japantown, San Jose is uh, really a cultural home for, for me. Definitely. <clears throat> My uh, father was one of the Japanese American Nisei physicians here in the Japantown area. <clears throat> uh, he was uh, born in the Berkeley, Oakland area. <clears throat> My mother actually was born in Southern California and actually is a key base. So during the war year, she actually was in Japan with her family while, some, uh, while her father, my grandfather, was in the camps. Um, uh, you know, I was really my. I was a part of the Yokohama, California band. I was uh, very honored and privileged to play with them. Uh, I was uh, probably maybe the fourth member that came on the, into the band, um, and I was just a kid who liked to play guitar. And uh, because of our connection with with Wesley United Methodist Church here in San Jose, um, I would always hear 
Mike and Peter and Sam play guitar and sing, and uh, just was so uh, admired them so much for their musical talents and their songwriting talents. It just uh, it was a privilege to be asked to be a part of that, and really I just had a small minor role really, but uh, uh, that's my background. I'm PJ Hirobayashi. I was born and raised in Marin County, San Rafael, and um, never had a very, very clear sense of what Japanese American identity was. So I never was in my body or my skin uh, until much later in life. And um, what drew me, well, I, I went to UC Berkeley and graduated from there, um, where Peter says, that we met there. Asian American Studies was very, very prominent, um, had prominent impact on where I was to go in terms of community organizing and my place in how I connect with community, Japanese American community. So I was still searching and I had to go to Japan to think that's where my people were, only to find that, oh, they're, I'm not their people. <laughs> And, and trying to resettle back here. And actually, it was Roy that told me about a possible job um, in 1974 um, that actually brought me to San Jose. And it was my introduction to San Jose Japantown, a Japanese American community. It was my introduction to becoming a charter member of the forming San Jose Taiko. Hi, my name's Roy Hidabayashi, so PJ and I are married, a um, couple. Uh, <laughs> just to be clear, some people think we're brothers and sisters. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we are within the soul respect, I guess. <laughs> uh, I was born in Berkeley, raised in Oakland, and I like to be specific, East Oakland, basically. Uh, so I spent up through my high school years in Oakland, which was at that time, um, you know, in the 50s and 60s, kind of a tough neighborhood area. A lot of things going on. The Black Panther Party was organizing. And, um, that was when the Civil Rights Education Act went through in 64, so there was a lot of busing going on, which I was part of when going to high school. And uh, So that whole scene, uh, being uh, identity of being Japanese and Japanese American was really kind of obvious to me in a way. My parents were both Kibay, so there was that going on too. I uh, spoke Japanese at home, and I spoke English to them in response. Um, and so that's how I kind of grew up, and uh, there's five kids, and I'm in the middle of five, basically. Um, growing up, my parents uh, wanted me to learn Japanese, so every Saturday we'd go to Japanese language school, and then there was also, we had uh, affiliated to the Oakland Buddhist Church, we'd have a service on Saturdays, but uh, have a Sunday school service there at this, uh, the Eden Township JCL building in San Lorenzo. So I spent a lot of my youth high school and junior high school days active in the Japanese community within that context, basically. Um, but involved with a lot of music, Western style music, playing trombone and piano growing up from very early on. I uh, came to San Jose to go to school, um, and that's uh, when I realized that there was a lot going on in this world with the third world strike going on, and, anti-war movement and um, getting involved in different community things like Peter mentioned. Um, just kind of jumped into the Asian American scene and got very active with Asian American studies, which was just starting in South Jose State in 1970. And I became uh, what, what they called a student coordinator early on and helped direct that program until I finished school there. Um, but as part of that, you know, music was always part of my interests. Uh, Reverend Hiroshi Abiko uh, wanted to start something at the Buddhist temple to try to get the youth involved. So that's how we began the South Sea Taiko group with uh, Reverend Hiroshi Abiko and Dean Yakusa and myself. Um, we began that and talking about that in 1973 and got that going at that point. And that has been the change point for me, I guess, in my life, basically. Um, kind of stayed with Taiko all, ever since then and it's really kind of uh, been my life at this, at this point um, for the past many years. But still very active, naturally, in Japantown here in San Jose. Um, got involved with the early group that was mentioned, Asians for Community Action, when we first started that as an off-campus group, and just a lot of different community organizations here in San Jose, the JCO, um, now the Japantown Community Congress, uh, and various other things. So um, my history kind of goes all over the place, especially here in Japantown and known everyone here on this panel for 
40 <laughs> plus years now. Mm -hmm. well, I'm Steve Yamaguma, and um, <clears throat> I was uh, born and raised in San Mateo, kind of a suburban kid who really didn't, you know, identify with any particular group or what have you. But um, early on, I was uh, really interested in music. My parents actually were the first uh, teachers of ballroom dancing to the Japanese community. Mm -hmm. And they would go around the Bay Area, South Bay, San Francisco, East Bay, teaching uh, JCL or churches and so forth. So at an early age, you know, I kind of started to listen to the music and get into it. Um, later on in the fourth grade, uh, my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Kume, from, was from Hawaii. She handpicked a bunch of us to play the ukulele. She taught us ukulele and then we would play for the school and so forth. Um, and then later in high school, uh, I used to sneak up to San Francisco and my friend and I would go to the Fillmore West maybe once or sometimes twice a month. And um, you know, I was only like 15 and I had a curfew at midnight but my friend didn't so I slept over at his house, you know. <laughs> uh, but we had a chance to uh, see a lot of music and meet a lot of different people, including uh, the Santana Band, who I, I met some of the uh, players there, really got interested in percussion. And so we had several, you know, garage bands in San Mateo, and one of them, uh, my friend Glenn Kilmore, started this band, and he called it Sun and Steel. And that was a book by a famous Japanese um, author, uh, Yukio Mishima. We didn't know what it meant. It just sounded cool. And uh, <laughs> we incorporated percussion and horns and so forth. Uh, and then I came down to San Jose State. And like a lot of the other people, uh, what's this Asian American studies thing? So. I know there was a lot of potluck dinners and lunches, so I used to <laughs> go there and uh, really started getting into you know, the different activities, including the uh, Asian Film Festival, uh, Jazz Festival, uh, and then off campus uh, you know, with a bunch of people, we started this uh, event called Bamboogie, which was, we felt was the first Pan-Asian festival right here at the Filipino Community Center. And we brought San Francisco Taiko to San Jose for the very first time. And this is the first time I heard them and just blew me away. And you know, here we were, we were kind of young kids banging on bongos and congas and whatever. And then we see this Taiko drum and just kind of turned me around. Um, later then, uh, Roy was telling me about Reverend Abiko and we uh, raised, we, we did a fundraiser to raise money for the drums, which then he went and got the drums from LA. And then later, my friends, we, we came in and you know, we're just a bunch of long hair hoods and we started uh, looking at these drums and got excited and started banging on them. Uh, so, you know, it was a very informal, loose, uh, you know, it was a collective of uh, people that were just interested and were just trying to find out who we were and express ourselves in a way that isn't just copying, you know, the black music or the Latino or we're trying to carve out something that's our own, which we still didn't, you know, figure that out. But uh, And la later on, um, I got involved in other, you know, activities, uh, uh, actually more not just the Japanese community, but other uh, Asian communities and so forth, um, including like the Pacific People's Theater Festival and uh, the Japanese American Community Bicentennial Celebration, which was the forerunner of Nikki Matsuri, um, on and on, a bunch of others. Oh, and then meeting Yokohama, California. Uh, I think we were playing at uh, Foothill College and then afterwards Peter, Sam, Michael came on and this 
Unfortunately, she's not here, but this woman with this long hair, crazy, whatever, just blew me away. And uh, we had to get to know them. So I don't know if you remember, we jammed afterwards. We went in that side room, jammed, and that's how I got to know. Uh, <laughs> okay, and then um, we do, not only do we have people internationally visiting us, but we have people from Colorado here with us live. And that's Gary Tsuchimoto. Gary, could you say something, a little bit about you? Can you hear me? Oh, hi. Hi, everyone. It's my, okay. Uh, I I kind of been living. Oh, I grew up in East Palo. I'll start there, which is a black ghetto. So uh, my upbringing was kind of strange. I was always trying to fit in, but I found a way to do it through athletics. So I was very active in athletics growing up, and um, I eventually moved to San Jose to go to school there. And I in my one of my classes, I think it was a Japanese language class, I met Steve, and then we started hanging out. And so Steve told me about the um, Taika group forming. I had heard it that it had been a youth group, and so now um, it was gonna be open to adults, or we were in our 20s, so our age, our age group. And uh, so I checked it out, and that first night, and then, like Steve said, it was just a, a bunch of guys. We had been together in a makeshift band for uh, all during the year. And so immediately we just on the drums and started playing. We didn't know what we were doing, but we, we created rhythms and we could talk to each other through the drums. So that was a really, uh, great experience for me. Uh, it kind of opened me up to um, to new ideas and, and, and new experiences and meeting a lot of new people. And uh, at the time, uh, I didn't know I would stay with it, but I'm still playing taiko to this day. In fact, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a professional taiko player and I, I tour for nine months of the year, uh, performing taiko with my wife, Nancy. And uh, what we're doing is, uh, as we travel, we're trying to open the minds of youth around the country. We do educational shows in public and private schools and some colleges. And so we're bringing Japanese to the rural, rural foothills of Kentucky and plains of Kansas and Nebraska. And we're meeting a lot of people who are really open especially the administrators who are open to uh, opening the minds of their their, their students um, because they're in a very closed in uh, um, community and they only see themselves. And so it's really rewarding for us to have that opportunity to bring a bit of Japanese and Japanese American culture to, to all across the country. And uh, that's enough for now. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm just going to move into the next section. So, because we have a lot of things I'd like you to have a chance to talk about. And, and this has to do with the 1970s. Um, you've already touched upon this a little bit, but I thought maybe we can, you can add some more to it. And th the first question I have is, what were the big issues of the time period that you remember being the most important to you? And of course, you know, like the war in Vietnam, peace movement, a lot of other things. but. If you can, if, if any of you'd like to say what was the main thing on your mind in the 1970s, and if there wasn't anything, that's okay too, because I'm just trying to get an idea of what was happening with you back then. Anybody can start. Yes? You know, one of the things I was going to mention was, um, I believe it was 1968 when Martin Luther King was killed. Was that right? Correct. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I remember senior year in high school is when we had riots on campus and it was like a instant division between the very, we, you know, Hill, Hillsboro people went to San Mateo High School. So we had the ultra rich, we had the very poor, we had the black community, and then the, the Japanese community was sort of a small little subset. And there was this big divide 
and um, we had riots on campus. They shut down our school, and then we had to have these workshops with the police come in and so on and so forth, and people got up and tried to air their grievances and so forth. And it was very apparent that you know there was a big divide there. And this is how we left high school. And so the Japanese community, my friends and others, were we weren't sure where we were. We were kind of like, we had friends here and friends here, and we're just kind of in the middle, if you will. And so going off to college, um, that influenced me, along with the war in Vietnam. There was a lot of protests. And I think the Asian American Studies program kind of gave us an opportunity to say, well, maybe this is part of who we are. I think those were some of the main drivers in terms of my past. Oh. Anything else? Well, I'll add, I mean, 68 was kind of significant. For me growing up, I mentioned in our neighborhood, the Black Panther Party was organizing even earlier than that. And so 68 was also significant because of the National Democratic Convention that happened in Chicago, which was uh, a big riot happening there where there was a lot of um, protesting basically going on. And, and following that, uh, just going into college, is, uh, it was kind of the aftermath of that whole wave of the anti-war movement that was starting to happen. And so um, for me, just uh, trying to put myself into a political and social perspective of how I fit in was uh, really kind of difficult because um, I, I was really trying to identify myself at that time. And so becoming, uh, coming onto the campus and learning uh, about the start of Asian American studies and, and the, the, that kind of thing was uh, why I really kind of latched on to that pretty quickly, um, just to get involved with that. And um, 1970 was kind of also significant because that's when they had the Chicago JCL convention, where unfortunately one, one of the um, younger junior JCL members was, was killed. And, and, um, and in that incident, it really kind of rallied the community around a lot of different issues because it sort of became a black Asian issue at that point too. And so um, just trying to understand again uh, who and what we were as people of color and what that meant. Uh, out of that convention came Chris and Joanne, you know, the Yellow Pearl uh, work basically. So um, musically, trying to identify to, you know, what was going on because music still is very important for me. And um, when I first started Sounds A State, I got recruited not to do ethnic music or what I wanted to do, but I got recruited to actually be in a marching band, which is very, not what I wanted to be doing, but it was just, uh, I just realized that music was still a very important part of my life, no matter what it was. And so just to understand how what other people were doing and what that meant um, really became kind of uh, interesting. So hooking up with Steve and, and some of the early dance band music, cover band stuff, and just just having jam sessions or participating in, in the PG and I hosted, I don't know how many sessions at our home, people would come over and play. And just uh, that kind of thing was happening. But the political co climate, I think, was kind of uh, interesting to note that um, what was happening nationally and what was happening in San Jose on campus was one thing, but what was happening in Japantown here in San Jose was like totally different because Japantown was so, uh, I guess, um, I, I feel just so conservative at that time. Um, it really didn't impact, it seemed like, what was going on nationally because the people here were, um, it didn't seem to affect them. And that's, that was kind of a, uh, an, a concern for us as far as being students on campus, which is why the group Asians for Community Action was formed. And we started doing organizing work in, on, in Japantown, basically. I came from uh, more of a white student anti-war activist <laughs> um, against the Vietnam War. And it wasn't until I went, went to um, Cal State Hayward when I realized that there was an Asian contingent of students against the war and these very radical white students. And we were marching for the same reason, but we were kind of going this way. <laughs> and um, it got me to think about, well, well, who am I? I should be on that side because they look like me, I look like them. Uh, and it had provoked my interest um, to take an Asian American Studies class at Hayward. So in addition to what was happening during that time frame, um, I, I was immersed in, in the question of identity and who I was. And also to see friends that were um, having to deal with going into war, 
um, having to fight Asian faces. Um, it, it had me question a lot about identity. Um, and this spurred my interest to leave Hayward to go to Berkeley and take Asian American Studies classes. And it was there that I realized that uh, to be immersed in Asian American Studies, it was not about, there, there weren't any materials to learn from. There was nothing written in books. So uh, our first ethnic studies classes like was Harry Edwards teaching a class. And I'm going, holy smokes. You know, this is really now, that, that's our history. And wow, we're all people of different ethnic backgrounds, but that's still who I'm connected to. And, and to read things that were already written for ethnic studies at that time is going, wow. This is very self-revealing. Um, so with that happening, that was the, the, the temperature or the gauge of what was going on. And with Chris and Joanne uh, coming out and going from community to community across the US, it's the first time. They're singing about me. They're singing songs that they created that, that I can really relate to. So I've never heard anything like this. And it was kind of forming my social consciousness at the same time. And um, that, at the same time, too, was uh, I, I was with San Jose State Asian American Studies as a coordinator and working with community classes. How about anybody else? Do yeah. you have anything you'd like to add about the time period? And, um, I graduated high school in 1976. Um, so I'm a little bit younger than <laughs> some of the rest of the, the panel here. I, I think I was less attuned to what was happening, going on in the world, as I was really kind of trying to figure out who I was. Um, and that had, had a lot to do with my experience of just daily life. Um, my family, when I was two, moved from San Jose to Los Gatos, which would be a more affluent kind of um, living community, uh, mostly white. And uh, the story that our family kind of grows up with is the fact that when we tried to move there, when my parents tried to buy the house um, back there in, what, 1960 or so, um, the neighbors all petitioned the realtor not to sell the home to our, our Japanese family. So. Um, I, as I recall, my mom just bent over backwards to, well, actually someone in the community stood up against the tide of everybody else and said, this is not right. And so we did move into the home that I eventually grew up uh, in. But my mom, I always felt like bent over backward to be especially nice to elementary school, junior high, and high school. I always felt like um, <laughs> the the in order to survive, it was like, okay, how do I survive all this without, you know, getting through the day without getting called a derogatory name or, or, or maybe even get a beat up or something like that, right? I mean, that, those were my daily concerns in the, in the 70s, I think. Um, when I was in elementary school, that's when I started to get into music. I took guitar lessons in an after-school program and uh, the guy who was teaching the class was taught us songs from like Bob Dylan and Pete Seeger and Peter Paul and Mary and all these these songs, you know that um, that had a, a tremendous impact on me. I didn't realize until much later because the music was all about the message. It wasn't so much how good your voice quality was. It was all about what kind of message you were trying to convey through music to address some kind of social issues, right, um, uh, as social commentary. And uh, so that always really stuck with me. Uh, for me in the 70s, my relationship to the church, which I keep coming back to, was important because the person who was in charge of our youth group at that time, our high school group, was a person by the name of Grant Hagia. And he was at San Jose State there at that time, um, involved with the Asian American Studies program over there. He eventually, and is now one of the bishops in the Uni our United Methodist Church denomination. 
But as I recall, our lessons mostly focused on um, Asian American identity, Japanese American history, racism and prejudice. And, it's, and, and he related all that to our faith um, in terms of God siding um, uh, for ju social justice and siding with the oppressed, those kinds of issues. Um, that was a turning point for me in terms of figuring out who I was. Um, I think it was James Mishner who once said, this is the journey that all men must make to find themselves. If they fail in this, it matters not much else what they find. And um, I think for me, church was, was that kind of turning point for me. Uh, and then when I started hearing people express their own like sansei experience um, or, or you know isei nisei sansei experience through music it just it just clicked with me in a in a an amazing kind of way and uh, that's what kind of brought me I think into connection with uh, Yokohama California band members. I had a little bit of a different experience I think growing up I grew up in the Sacramento Valley uh, in the town of Florin and, and uh, actually thanks to uh, Minoru-san, um, I actually found out a little bit more about the history of Florin than I actually knew <laughs> when I was growing up there. Um, so when I was growing up though, it was in the, the 50s, the late 50s, early 60s, um, and it was a rural community, a farming community. It had a small but significant uh, Japanese American population, most of whom were farmers. Uh, and grew, grew strawberries and and uh, but a lot of our friends were were white um, not too many other minorities a uh, few Filipinos um, and I think the way that I, I look at it is kind of similar to how the Nisei grew up before the war uh, that they thought of themselves as Americans first and Japanese second and um, so you know we uh, at least me I, I felt like I was an American, you know, and, and then um, I moved to Berkeley my senior year in high school uh, when, in 1968 and 69 when a lot of things were happening culturally uh, and politically. Um, and then I ended up uh, going to, to Berkeley. Uh, I applied in uh, physical sciences because uh, I liked physics in high school. And, uh, and then I figured out pretty quickly that it was not really what I wanted to do, in addition to being uh, more difficult than I thought it would be. But um, then I saw that there was an Asian American Studies class, um, and I said, wow, what is this? It's like, this is something that I'm really interested in finding out about. And um, actually, that's when I met Michael Omi, who's in the audience here, and uh, we became fast friends and are still friends today. Uh, but trying to find out who we are, I think, uh, really, you know, like most of the people do when they go to college, you know, they, that's part of the journey. Um, but really, in addition to the normal college experience, I think it really was kind of a special time. Um, I was talking to Barbara earlier about, we're kind of like in the right place in the right time, uh, but also we all kind of came to the realization at the same time you know, this is a, an opportunity for us, instead of moving away from our communities, as a lot of people did, it was a way for us to turn around, look back at our communities, and go back to our communities, and, and look and see, and we thought things needed to be changed, and we decided that we were the ones to try to make that change. You know, and, and looking around now, you know, I think we've done some good things. And we were fortunate in that we were able to do that. Um, but I think part of it was us, that, that we wanted to do that. And, and like the other folks, um, I saw Chris and Joanne play uh, when I was at a, a particularly opportune period of time. And uh, my friends and I were Asian American, you know, said, we got to learn these, these songs. We sang these songs for each other and for as many other people that would listen to them. And, and I guess we played them together at that Sour Misa thing that I had forgotten about. Um, 
But, uh, you know, and then I met uh, Michael Kazaki at the Lake Sequoia Retreat, and he was only 15 at the time, and he was learning how to play guitar, but it was a very quick study, and, and we started playing together. And that's actually how I came to San Jose, is because he was living in San Jose and with his family at the time, and my parents were in San Jose, and so I would come down and visit him and we'd start playing together. And then he met Sam at the Wesley Church, and the three of us started playing together. And we played some kind of acoustic folk songs, but also some Christian jazz songs. Gary, do you have anything to add, Gary, about the 1970s and the impact it had on you? Um, uh, just a few things. I, I grew up in uh, among minorities in Toronto, so uh, and my parents were uh, not involved in any of the community and then so I was pretty well sheltered from what was going on in the world until I moved down to San Jose uh, after high school or after uh, junior college. But my parents, they were poor, so they just said, good luck, you're on your own. <laughs> so my, I was just talking to San Jose. So I was, took all my energy just to find work and pay the rent uh, and so, so I could stay there. But I was naturally drawn to the Asian community in San Jose. Uh, I initially lived with some uh, other young Asians who I think were later, uh, well, they formed a group that later became Asians for community action, like Terry Kameda and Tadashi Kameda. And uh, I remember Dwayne Kubo was there too, so uh, I think Dwayne remembers me back then, a uh, very shy kid. Uh, and did have a really strong direction of, of what to do at that time. But um, joining in with uh, those people and later joining San Jose Taigikoho, which I stayed uh, in the group through uh, till about 1989 from the initial first meeting with them in 1974, so 15 years or so, uh, that was really gave me a direction and let me utilize playing taiko as a way to express myself. So I was really, this is more about my musical experience rather than politics. Um, I, all through high school, I listened to jazz and world music. And so uh, taiko was just an extension of that. And so uh, I thought, well, I can use things that I, that I feel in my body and use that and type I began composing my spirit and kind of give me a direction. Thank you, Gary. Some of, some of it got a little garbled, but I think it's, oh. it's all right. Um, you know what I'd like to do since Gary, you started this, if it's okay with the audience, I'd like to go into the, the next part about the music. All of you just started jumping ahead and talking about the music, which is <laughs> the other part that I wanted to focus on. I mean, I know we're doing like an oral history interview about music in the 70s. We don't have any music playing, so I'm sorry about that. But So I figured we should spend some time talking about that, because this is something I'm really interested in, is the influences you had and connections with developing a different style of music or and what it meant to you. So if we could just go into that. Um, you've already talked about how, and most of you um, talked about how you got involved in music. Um, but can you talk a little bit about your influences? Gary just mentioned jazz. And um, could you share a little bit more about that? Whatever it was, that either was popular music or certain style of music or you know was a content. If, if any of you want to make a comment about that, that what uh, started you off in in a certain style and then how that might change. Well, so as soon as I could drive, I would drive into the San Francisco and go to Keystone Corner, uh, jet locked it. And there was Keystone jet venue in San Francisco. It's great musicians at the time. And what impressed me and what 
was very similar with kind of the spontaneity of their playing and how collectively would support each other um, during and allow each other to express themselves individually on instruments through song. And uh, exactly similar to Tanko because we were making up the music as we went. So we're just improvising and trying to create something. And what I liked about jazz was the groove. And so I, I do, that was, and I wanted to put in some Taika music was, was the feel from jazz that the, mus that the musicians uh, created. And uh, so uh, that, that was my uh, imp inspiration, jazz music. So, so Gary, a little a bit of um, a garble, but it sounds like you were saying that the Keystone was like a jazz club and that you got to hang out with other people, were they percussionists that influenced you in terms of jazz improvisation? Is that what you were saying? Uh, yeah, that's what I was saying. The club was called Keystone Corner. It was in San Francisco and I just was a uh, in the audience. So I, you know, I went to watch and just by being there and experience it, experiencing the music and the, and the playing live, that, that was my greatest influence. And it's not really I got a chance to play with anyone because I was just a beginner at that time, long time ago. Or that was even before time ago. Well, I, I think there's a lot of different influences for me, like I mentioned about my parents doing the following dance mm -hmm. type of music. Um, my uh, uh, cousin actually, George Manami Jr., um, after high school he left, went to New York, and he was in the original Broadway play um, of, um, uh, I was going to say Sound of Music, but uh, Oh, Flower John? Flower John song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a little mixed up there. And uh, so we, we would actually um, go to, you know, San Francisco to see plays, musicals, and so forth with my parents. But on the other side, I, I was sneaking up to, you know, uh, Fillmore West, and then I would go to like Keystone and Basin Street and so forth. Um, so we had this whole rock thing going on, but Basin Street was more uh, soul, jazz, and so forth. So it was very eclectic. And then when I came down to San Jose um, with meeting Gary and others, you know, we would sort of combine all that. Like uh, one of our friends, Tom Tam, he had a house, and he had this milk can, this metal milk can. We talked about that, mm -hmm. and I just gravitated to that thing and it sounded so sweet, you know, nice, plain. And we combined that with, you know, cans and buckets and <laughs> drums, everything. And I don't know whether it was world music or ghetto music or whatever. We're going to have free you do style. a concert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but, so it was very freestyle, uh, sort of jazzy influence, world music and so forth. Uh, Sort of a eclectic. I think we were trying to find ourselves at that time. I was, I don't know if it was the same day <laughs> or uh, another party at Tom Pan's, but uh, at, the, at the dinner table, it's like everything kind of broke out into music by the chawan and, and, and the hashi <laughs> and then anything else that sound, had any sound. And uh, Russell Baba was there as very, you know, um, had a a lot of influence in the scene here. Um, I think that was kind of like, oh, yeah, you have kind of some natural rhythm there. Maybe you should check out the taiko. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I was, I was going to ask, I'm going to get into Yokohama, California, so don't worry, <laughs> but um, I was going to ask you all about the influences of traditional Japanese music or Asian music how that kind of fit into this. Some of you already mentioned you heard Taiko and that really changed everything about how you, but it sounds like you were searching for something too. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, for me, um, you know, growing up early on, one of my early mentors was actually this guy, uh, my teacher, Bill Bell, um, who was a more of a jazz pianist. 
And so that's where I kind of started learning the jazz side of things. And this was junior high school and in high school. Um, but in, in, during that time, you know, there was a bunch of us that were playing, or students of his. Some of those guys moved on and actually started the, the band, uh, Sly Stone band. You know, uh, they were in that band early on. Um, so it was a lot of R&B stuff and, and jazz stuff that was going on. Um, but my parents, you know, it was kind of a mix at home because my mom loved to listen to Japanese folk songs. So she would always play the Japanese folk song stuff, which I didn't pay attention to much, but it was always kind of on. And then my father, which was kind of interesting, he would listen to it, and actually he was primary Japanese speaking, but his favorite music was actually Western, country Western music. And so he would listen to all these early country Western guys, you know, which, you know, also wasn't really my taste in music, but we would have to listen to it. And then my brothers were into more the folk rock stuff, like the Kingstone Trio, Lime Lighters, and all those groups that were happening at that time. Um, so, and then actually the Beatles came, and so uh, for me it was really a combination of a lot of musical styles that really kind of uh, developed in what I was doing. And when I got into high school, my playing the trombone, it was actually focused more on Western classical music, orchestra, and band and stuff. So, kind of stuff, uh, doing jazz band stuff and stuff, but not really was part of it. For me, the Japanese music was listening to what my mom listened at home, and perhaps what I heard at the Japanese festival of Obon, basically, in Oakland, the Oakland Temple. And so outside of that, it wasn't like I was trying to duplicate or really try to do any of that kind of music because it didn't really um, mean a whole lot to me. Um, after hearing Chris and Joanne play and starting to do talk about thematic songs about the Asian American experience, I started to realize, wow, I grew up listening to R&B, soul, jazz, um, Latin, salsa, whatever, and when I went to dances or parties, that's all the music we played, but, or heard, listened to, there was no J.A. or Japanese American music that we listened to. There was none of that happening. And so um, I, I began to question, what is our Japanese American music sound, or do we have one? Mm -hmm. And so um, when we started Sounds Like Taiko, for me that was kind of one p piece that was uh, really intriguing and kind of important for me as well. I realized early on that this was an opportunity to perhaps create that sound, uh, the Japanese American sound, for, for what I feel was kind of important. Mm -hmm. Along with what was happening with what Chris and Joanne was doing, and perhaps some of the other folks like what Peter and folks are starting to do, or PJ was doing early on too. But, um, but other influences was like Hiroshima, because they were very active doing their thing. Um, PJ mentioned Russell Baba because I first met Russell when I first got onto campus at San Jose State in 1969. Um, I heard the saxophone playing in the in the parking lot, and I was like, "Who is playing up there?" And it was Russell Baba just playing by himself <laughs> up there. And so, um, and, you know, people like that. But it was also because I was a trombone player. It was bands like Tower of Power, uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, uh, Cold Blood, and all this stuff. Then I realized in Cold Blood there was this amazing guitar player called Mike, Michael Sasaki this crazy, crazy guitar player, um, who um, really kind of uh, was, you know, like first time I'm seeing an Asian, Japanese guy, Japanese American guy, really up there playing that kind of stuff. And um, this amazing guitar player, and was fortunate as much many years later to connect with him in different ways, but um, it was kind of all these different things that was for me kind of formulating to kind of create or help kind of established early on, uh, I guess, my kind of career path in, in, in music, if you want to say. Sure. Well, I was going to mention, um, you know, quite frankly, when we were kids and we would hear Japanese music and singing, uh, we would laugh at it because we, we didn't know. I mean, we didn't speak Japanese and it was kind of like odd, you know, to our ears. And then for the first year I was at San Jose State, I went to this concert in San Francisco with Stomu Yamashita. Mm -hmm. And uh, his group was, I think it was called Red Buddha Theater. Right. And he had keyboard, drums, guitar, bass, koto, shamisen, hue, and he was probably one of the first to do this crossover type of music. Completely blew me away. I mean, I thought, wow, you know, maybe there is something there. And this is a long time before Hiroshima, a long time before the Taiko group and so forth. 
And uh, I don't know if you've heard of Stomu Yamashita? Yeah, he was pioneer. Pioneer, yeah. Um, he, unfortunately, he passed away. Yeah, I heard of him. Uh, he, he was the son of the famous Buddhist church in Kyoto. Mm -hmm. So he has such a background. Yeah. Yeah. He's a yeah. super vision addict. <laughs> but uh, he's, he's, um, he's an addict. Did he get too early? Yeah, yeah. That's the people in the era didn't understand you. Yeah. Um, uh, this is Midori, uh, my interpreter from San Francisco, yeah. and my old friend of mine. Uh, she, she spent more than half of her life in San Francisco, <laughs> born in Tokyo. <laughs> Thank you. Well, he obviously had an influence on important people, important people here, <laughs> right in San Jose, huh? So if I could uh, switch over to Yokohama, California, because to me there's a connection in that. Um, I, I wanted to get more at uh, trying to find the Japanese American sound, if that's what you were thought you were doing. There's a part to it. Some of you already mentioned the content was really important. Uh, but then the musical influences too in Yokohama, California. So it was part of that whole time period um, after Hiroshima came. So if either of you want to talk about that or anything. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll, yeah. I'll start and yeah. you can chime in. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting because I'm, as I'm listening to uh, the panel, I'm, uh, I'm realizing that um, if I look at it from before I got involved doing Asian American music, you know, there's, there's clear influences. Like I listen to a lot of acoustical guitar music and like Crosby, Stills and Nash and Joni Mitchell and Peter Paul Mary and stuff, you know, and um, and in the 70s we listened to a lot of things like Tower of Power and Santana, and, you know, but, but it, and then I guess in some ways we took that and created our own music, uh, but a, a real large question even today is what is the Asian American sound, and, you know, and, and it's become clearer and clearer to me over the years. It's not one style of music. It's 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 not just Taiko, although it is certainly Taiko. You know, it's not just Yokohama, California, although we're certainly part of it. You know, it's not Mark Izu, who you know. Uh, <laughs> although he is certainly clearly a central part of that. You know, uh, and and but but for us in Yokohama, California, um, it was what we were trying to talk about through our lyrics. It wasn't really our the musical style. Um, if you listen to Robert Kikuchi and Goho's mm -hmm. piano playing, you know, it, it doesn't really evoke an Asian sound. It doesn't come from Japan or the Philippines. Uh, until later in, in his musical career, when he actually was playing with a band that featured kulintongs, a Filipino instrument. Um, you know, he, although he did play shakuhachi a little bit in the band. Um, you know, so he played a, a Fender Rhodes and and I played a, a Martin guitar, and you know, I, I think the only song that I can remember that had kind of an Asian feel to it was the song Hot August Morning, in which the chorus part of that song has some dissonance to it. And perhaps, I don't know about consciously, but perhaps um, there, it, it was intended to evoke some of the, the Japanese you know, sound from, from the instruments in Japan. Um, but uh, it was really the, the lyrical content. We we're trying to tell our own stories. And, and that's actually related directly to the name Yokohama, California, uh, because there was a Nisei uh, writer, Toshio Mori, who, who was in the Bay Area, and I had the privilege to get to know him and interview him. Um, and his book of short stories, uh, called Yokohama, California, published in 1949, was the first um, published uh, publication uh, of uh, Nisei, uh, t kind of telling our own stories, and that's what we were trying to do with our songs. Uh, so songs like Different Picture, where we're talking about how the media portrays us versus who we really are. Uh, songs like Tanfran, uh, which you know a lot of people didn't know then, and probably a lot of the Yonsei now don't know. You know, it's a shopping center to them, but it was where the Japanese were sent to in the beginning of World War II. 
Um, and that's what the song was about is Sam came over to my house visiting me in Berkeley and said, hey, I was just shopping over at Tanfer and then I said, hey, did you know that was an assembly center? And she said, no, I did not know that. And so we said, hey, let's write a song about that. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's, it's those kinds of things that came, some of them came directly from our experiences and some of them were things that we intentionally tried to write about. And the, the, even just the story of, of meeting Robert, um, Keith had reminded us that, um, that we, the four of us had started playing together and we went to UC Davis and they had an Asian American festival and you know, you see the typical cultural things that you see there, you know, and, and all of a sudden we're, we're, we're walking up to where the stage area is outside and there's this guy sitting on, on the stage and he had a, a keyboard, this is before the small kind of keyboards that you can just put on your lap. He had a Fender Rhodes flat on the stage and he was sitting down and playing music and singing. Uh, but, but it was the songs. These were some of the songs that later made it to the album. You know, he was singing Asian American songs and, he's, and we went up to him after he says, you sing Asian American songs and you write your own stuff? And, you know, and, and he said, you sing Asian American songs? And you, write your, you know, and it was like, Wow, we got to get together, and, and uh, you know Keith, Keith, and Mike and Sam. I think we're all still in high school then, um, and so we we had to wait until uh, winter vacation of that year. But we all got together. We went up to Robert's place in Davis, um, and I think we played music for two straight days. Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing Robert saying, because somebody was saying, "Well, you know, it's about dinner time," and he said something like, "Eat." You can eat any time. You can't play this music any time. So we just played on some more, and, and uh, it, that was really the beginning of, of the group. So. So, I, no, I don't. Peter said. I stole your story. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, yeah. It's uh, exciting times. Uh, as soon as we, we met uh, Robert, there was just this, instant connection like we got to play together yeah. it was exciting and uh robert with the you know bringing the keyboards into the band offered a different kind of sound yeah. too yeah. yeah when mostly it was a acoustic guitar mm -hmm. sam would occasionally play dulcimer mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. uh but yeah so robert added a lot how did you see the music you were doing whether you know you're consciously trying to create a different sound or through the content of the lyrics how did you see it connecting with what else was going on, either you know, regionally, statewide, or in the whole world, in terms of other people doing music? So you mentioned finding other people to do Asian American theme music was a big deal, and you connected with them. Um, but I know there's other connections that possibly were happening during this time period, you know, back then in the 70s, um, whether it was Yokohama, California, or other things you were doing, and what kind of influence did you feel like you were part of this other broader movement that was having an impact on influence? Well, it, for me, it was clearly, it was what, not just we want to play music together, you know. I mean, we felt like we were part of the Asian American movement and part of the whole third world movement, you know. It wasn't just us. Uh, it was all of us. And, and, you know, we wanted to play for community events where other people were talking about issues that were going on. Uh, you know, it was to try to educate ourselves in our communities. Um, yeah, and uh, it was kind of like we wanted to be like Chris and Joanne, although we really didn't go around the country doing this, you know, but we wanted to, to, to share what we were doing with others. I think what was exciting about those times was most of the venues that we played were uh, like Asian American Studies Week kind of uh, things at the various colleges and universities. And so the exciting thing about that was at that time, colleges and universities really were starting to affirm and develop Asian American studies programs at their, at their schools. And so that was, we were a part of you know, that, and that's where we were in constant connection with San Jose Taiko, because we'd be oftentimes performing at the same uh, Asian American Studies Week events. Um, and so, you know, that was, uh, that was, uh, felt like, you know, things were happening and, and voices were starting to be heard and schools of higher education were, 
affirming that. I remember sometime after that, when I came back to San Jose State, however, you know, San Jose State was, there seemed to be kind of this movement, this kind of subversive movement to deny credit uh, at San Jose State for, for uh, uh, using Asian American studies or ethnic studies for his, his U.S. history credit, something like that. And I remember us standing out there in, in some of the walkways <coughs> trying to get people to sign petitions to make sure that that didn't happen. So, um, you know, there was that kind of, it, I thought that was some of the things that were important in terms of what we were participating in. I, what comes to me for my first impact of how we were touching people were like at a, a community gathering um, where there were a lot of Issei still. And hearing us play very poorly on our drums <laughs> and repetitively the same rhythm patterns um, to see Issei cry. And then coming up to us and saying, wow, it makes me remember when I was a child in Japan, you make us so proud. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I think so with that, um, the sense of uh, how we support or what we could do for the community in general, uh, not only Asian American studies, but for, for a lot of us, Japantown, um, or the Asian American community at large, um, were all important. So participating in events, whether there's festivals or whatever, uh, became a big part of the performances that we were doing. Um, and, and I think that's been a, a real strong core value for how San Jose Taiko has developed since early on to, to today, basically, is that importance of connecting with Japantown, um, being part of Japantown, um, knowing now that we're uh, um, a figure that a lot of people recognize as part of what Japantown is all about. And so uh, understanding how we represent or can represent what Japantown's all about. It's um, really in a, it's still an ongoing um, key point for all our members, even though our members now weren't even born during the time when we first started, actually, because they're, they're in their 20s or early 30s right now. So, um, but that's still a core value that I think that's been important for us that's kind of carried on. And that really kind of kept a lot of our groups together early on. And so it's been, um, I think, to me, that's been the, the, the key issue of how, uh, how can we connect with our community, how can we support it, and what, what can we do to encourage other people to join us in what we're doing. I was going to mention a sort of different perspective back then, when, you know, um, in seven, early 70s, probably the dominant music scene was not what we were doing. Mm. There were like these dances and bands doing yeah. soul and yeah. R&B. Yeah. Yeah. That was a dominant music scene within the Asian American community. And at San Jose State, there is this radio program called Asian Horizons. And uh, that one year I was one of four disc jockeys. And we would rotate, you know, each week. Another disc jockey would do their own show and so forth. And everybody would be doing Earth, Wind, and Fire, and you know, etc. And then my turn, I would do like Yokohama, California, Hiroshima, <laughs> Taiko, and people were, were like, "What is that stuff?" <laughs> so you know, it was kind of going against the grain at the beginning. You know, it wasn't really widely accepted, but you know. Just kept on pushing it out there. Mm -hmm. you know, that was, that's how it was back then. Well, at this time, before we go to our final section, um, I wanted to know if the audience, if you had any either comments or questions, because I'm um, worried that it's building up in your brain and you're going to something bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, Tom? Yes. Uh, could you give me a four or five minutes? Because I'd like to tell. Okay, so something about the, what happened in Japan, and, uh, you okay. know, uh, I have something to tell you. Yeah, so, so uh, if, why don't we have some, if there's any other comments that we'd like to make, and then... Ah, uh, please, yeah. please, yeah. please go ahead. So, uh, any, uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I, uh, 
what Steve just said, I, I think it's really interesting because uh, in the 70s, music was very segregated, right? There were uh, black radio stations and there were white radio stations. And there was a black top 40 and there was a white top 40, right? And I'm just wondering how that all came together in San Jose, Japantown, because you're saying what, what uh, this new thing was happening was really different from the white and the black thing. But so San Jose, Japantown was very socially conservative. Right, so the the Nisei generation in their prime was dominating uh, social things, right? So how how did that work out? Like, you know, was there a conflict? And like, how did you defend yourself? Like, you know, what you were doing? Did you have to defend yourself, or did people say you're trying to be black, or did people say you're trying to be white, or you know what I'm saying? Like that. I. Well, as far as for Tycho, and I don't know if you could talk from your side, but for Tycho, um, since we're doing, like Steve was talking, our, our sound was not a traditional Japanese Tycho sound from Japan. We were just incorporating a lot of the experience musically, what we grew up with. So it was more to Afro-Cuban, Latin, jazz, whatever. So basically, we were just freeform drumming, like Steve mentioned. So um, yes, we got in trouble early on for just going on and on and on <laughs> without stopping and um, just not sounding like, you know, anything that's supposed to be Japanese according to what the Obon committee might be talking about or anything like this. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and so it, it, became, it became an issue for us and to the point, um, which unfortunately, which is why one of the reasons why sounds like Taiko with the group actually had to leave the Buddhist church. Is, uh, there was also conflict of scheduling, but basically um, there was a really conflict of ideology of what we were about and what the, what the and so the group became basically independent of what the church is. And so we had to make that decision in order to to say or decide what we wanted to be musically too. And um, but also it was a struggle for us musically because we realized too well we are using a Japanese instrument as, as far as taiko is concerned, so how do we relate to that and what does that mean? But we are using the influences of what we grew up with, so knowing that sounds like taiko um, was much different than say San Francisco taiko dojo, which had a sensei from Japan, or even Kinata taiko in, in LA, which were the other two groups that started before us, um, which was more from the Buddhist temple and had that kind of influence. Um, we realized early on we were a group that uh, was more contemporary in form and style and sound, but we wanted to create our own musical identity from that. And But we also had to really uh, kind of focus on the fact that we were using the Japanese drums, so how did that really, what did that mean for us too? And it took, took a while to develop that sense, I feel, uh, um, quite a while, almost um, the first 10 years at least was within that kind of I, I feel um, struggle of what the definitions of what all that meant um, after seeing um, what San Francisco Taito Dojo was doing or Kinata or even groups from Japan were starting to come in like Onde Koza or Koro or whatever. Um, but after a period of time then it became obvious that what we were doing and what people in Japan perhaps thought that was not real Taiko um, because even that was happening to us that the Japanese people in Japan were saying we were not authentic which we knew, um, and trying to also still state uh, what we were doing was important for us as Japanese American or as, as a, an American-based Taiko group, basically. Um, so we just pushed forward, I, I felt, as a group to continue what we were trying to do. Um, and I think most groups in America were starting to do that anyways at that time. So it was just creating the North American Taiko sound was being created all overall. I, I do want to say though, um, you know, Roy was right in that uh, at the beginning. Uh, the Buddhist Church didn't like us. I, I told you, uh, <laughs> uh, bones, you know, we banging away, and people wouldn't buy food and you know play games. They would just come hang out with us, you know, and, and didn't like us. But we were undisciplined. We're just a bunch of punks, just on drums <laughs> until um, there was a core group of us that we actually for a year went to San Francisco we studied Taiko under Tanaka Sensei we learned 
I even learned Japanese words, you know, and how they <laughs> <laughs> use it in music and, you know, bachi, thing, things that, you know, this is a stick, no, it's a bachi, you know, things like that. And, you know, we learned the discipline that uh, they went through, and I think that sort of uh, transformed us into uh, uh, a musical group. Um, so, um, even before we, Sensei Taiko, went up to study with San Francisco, uh, the group had to create a sound, and how that happened is, uh, I think Russell Baba recorded us live performing, uh, and that totally impressed uh, Mr. Tanaka uh, that he that this group was playing without any training, and he really thought it was great. And so that's how it sounds like Taiko got invited to to study at his dojo. And uh, so I think a lot of credit has to be given to the composers initially. Uh, Roy was saying there wasn't much happening the first 10 years, but I think San Jose Taiko was one of the first groups that composed their own music. We had very talented people. Steve Yamaguma wrote two songs um, for the group. Uh, probably the first two songs after our initial uh, jamming period, uh, he, he wrote Yoda Kobi Taiko and Furin Fazan. And then Jose Alcon, who was a professional uh, musician that came to play with San Jose, he wrote songs like Apache, Taiko, Charada. And so there was a lot of music created in that first. Um, those first 10 years that really put San Jose Taiko on the map. Uh, uh, you made us different groups because we weren't copying, and there was no YouTube, so we really couldn't copy any of <laughs> um, but I think that, that's really important to me that the composers get credit, because uh, without those songs that we created, um, I don't think, you know, it, we would just have been another type of group. And along with that, composers were the directors. If uh, whoever composed the song, it was their idea. So he he also choreographed it. So he, he developed the look of the taiko, how we play, angle stand or flat drums, et cetera. And that was my... Uh, goal too is I composed the song is how to choreograph it, how to make it look. And uh, even though we weren't playing traditional Japanese taiko, I felt it in my blood that I had these Japanese roots. So that, that was the influence, the power behind it. Even though it was we were creating uh, you know just a sound, you know, people would, some people like it, but I think it really, and so I'm stressing that the composer should get a lot of credit in the initial role. And Gary, beginning of Sounds Gary was one of the composers. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. How about you guys? Go ahead. Cool. Well, I want to say about San Jose Taiko, uh, when I was growing up listening to San Jose Taiko, I just felt it was exciting because I knew, I wasn't quite sure what was traditional and what was not, but I knew that they were taking what was traditional and, and it was kind of evolving through uh, a new expression of, of, of music through the Japanese American experience. And I just thought that was really amazing um, and uh, still continues today. Um, for us, I think my sense of it, and Peter, Peter can correct me, but I don't felt like we got so much criticism in terms of um, uh, with regards to the style of music. Because I think when people asked us to play at different places, they knew what our sound was, what our messages were. And, and so I think it was um, expected. Um, I, perhaps the, maybe one time, and maybe there were other times, I know that. Uh, was it you and Sam and Robert played opening for Kalapana at? Oh, Robert Berkeley? and Sam. Yes. Robert and Sam Robert, opened yeah. for Kalapana. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure how that was, but that was would have been interesting because here you have 
maybe different kind of styles of music kind of coming together, and I'm not sure how the audience would have re would have reacted to that. Peter might might be able to share a little bit about that because I don't think to that audience our sound was under known, right? <laughs> You're right. Yeah. 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 Right. was from Hawaii. Hawaii, Hawaii yeah. very yeah. popular yeah. Uh, band at that time. They're very popular even in Japan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I want to echo what, what, yeah. what Keith said about the Taiko group because I remember hearing them and I, I remember being very impressed because you guys were writing your own pieces yeah. um, and playing your own pieces and nobody else was doing that. Yeah. And, and the creativity was, was just, you know, it still resonates today. You see the Taiko groups when they play in Japantown and whether it's at the Methodist Church or the Buddhist Church or when the, they had the spirit of Japantown or Nikkei Matsuri, whatever it is, you know, every time the Taiko comes up, all of a sudden the place is packed, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, yeah, yeah. and that's because it means something, you know, and it's not it's not people saying to their kids, "Hey, come and listen to this group," right? It's not that. It's the people themselves coming and saying, you know, this is something that means something to me, um, and. And we really, you know, appreciate that about the, the group, even today. I mean, their, your success is, is, you know, continuing and long-standing and all the way through, all the way from the beginning. And, and uh, that meant a lot to us, too. And in fact, you know, you, you guys had the cassette tape of the Taiko group, you know. And I still can't figure out why Steve didn't do a record album <laughs> with you guys. But even the Taiko tape, you know, I bought one and played it in my car, you know, just driving everywhere, and it, it was really great. Um, but I think, like Keith said, for the most part, you know, people knew who we were, you know, they knew they weren't getting a soul band or a rock <laughs> band, you know, or a jazz band, they knew who we were. And, and um, yeah, when, when uh, Robert and Sam played for Kalapana, it seemed a little odd to me, mm. yeah, because... Yeah, these, these were people who wanted to hear Kalapana. They really did. And of course, you know, you always have an opening act for a group, you know. But um, I, Kalapana was really a pop, pop yeah, group, you really. know. And so I think people did have a little trouble kind of figuring out what, what is this? <laughs> even, even though there are a lot of Asian Americans that went to go see them, I yeah, think it was that yeah. way. Yeah. You know, so many things from Japan, so I need to talk about something. Well, <laughs> uh, first off, and um, but I was so uh, like Yokohama, California members. I was so shocked when I first uh, bought a vinyl record of. A grain of sand in, back in 1981 in a small record shop in Venice Beach in LA. And uh, before I went to that shop, I visited visual communications and then I met Dwayne. Yeah. And uh, I, I remember that I did a $100 donation to the visual communications. Uh, <laughs> hi. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very happy to see him again, okay. And anyway, um, um, I, my, I was born in 1956, so between Keith and Peter, so almost the same generation. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I entered into a uh, university um, in the middle of 1970s, uh, the political movement, I mean, student movement in Japan was over. I mean, uh, it, some people still, uh, you know, Doing some some something you know the, some in on the street on in, in, inside the campus, but uh, uh, we are tired tired of uh, the movement like like your song mm -hmm. uh, um, <laughs> 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 yeah. and uh, I myself uh, the the country just a country boy, but I be, I be, I try to become a. Uh, the city board, you know, <laughs> so uh, just like uh, the Yokohama California song, so I'm wondering where I'm going. <laughs> so the uh, uh, I, I, I don't want I don't want to kill time. So uh, from from now I speak Japanese and the Middle East and uh, mm -hmm. translate. Mm -hmm. 
まあ、Japanese into English。えっ、ー、と、70年代に、70s? えっ、ー、と、僕は、あの、二人のいいあの先生に会いました。I met two teachers? あのえっ、ー、と、二人とも、この二人が、ボブ・ディランの,あの詩を全部日本語に訳しました。Both of them translated Bob Dylan's、uh, lyrics in Japanese? あの、二人とも,も京都の大学で、大学の先生をして。They both、uh, professors in、uh, colleges in And、その一人の一人が、えーえー、中山陽という人でした、えー、とその前に初めて日本で翻訳された、えー、と翻訳というのは非常に日本人にとっては大切です。So、translation is very important in Japan. あの僕たちは最低でも6年間英語を勉強します。So、we, we at least six years English. <笑>の最初の日系アメリカ人による小説で最初に日本語に訳されたのが年を見るのです。I think the second half of the 1970s,、uh, a lot of Asian American literature were you know, introduced to our world in the literature world.、Uh, this is the translation of、uh, Woman Warrior by Maxim h o p k i n s This is the translation of Woman Warrior by Maxim h o p k i n s I even, あの僕はあのマックス・キング・キングストンが京都にアメリカンカルチャルセンターというのがあったんです。There was a アメリカンカルチャルセンターに京都。彼女がそこで講演会をしました。She had a there. えっと、80年代。In the 80s? And, 僕は彼,にあ彼女に会って、I, I met him, あのあ、うん、あのここにあのオートグラフがあっ<笑><笑><笑>それで、あの。えっと、さっきアイデンティティの話がしてましたけど。あの面白いことに、あの日本語にはアイデンティティにとイコールになる言葉がないです。In Japanese, there is no、word for identity. だから、日本の学者はいろんな難しい言葉を作りました。So Japanese uh, scholars created the very difficult words to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. あのだけど、それは。ほ,ほとんど使われてないですだから僕たちはあの日本語でアイデンティティー。そう、we say identity.Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <笑> And、um, 僕が学生の時は、やっぱりその時は僕はそんなに感じなかったですけど、I didn't feel that 今から考えると、やっぱりアイデンティティについてすごく悩んでた。Now I think that I was actually thinking about my identity. えー、その時、えー、っと、この年をもりとか、ノノボーイ、まあ特にこのノノボーイは僕にとっては、なんていうかな、雷に打たれたような。I felt like I was hit by lightning when I read ノノボーイ。あの僕のひいおじいさんは一世でした。My great grandfather was 一世。Into Hawaii ね。Into Hawaii。で、まあ彼はすごく大成功しました。お金持ちで僕のおばあさんをあの日本で教育させるように、ハイエデュケーション。ハイエデュケーション。だからそのお金を持ってたから、日本に戻した。So、he out her back to Japan. で、日本の男と結婚させた。だけど、えっと、僕のおばあさんの弟。My grandmother's brother, brother. けど、えっとまあ、キベです。He's 
えっとハワイにえっとホームステイしてました。I, uh, えっとティーンエイジャーで。When I was a teenager, I lived in Hawaii. えー、それから1980年と81年に、えー、あのこのカリフォルニア、えー、とカリフォルニアを旅行しました。カリフォルニアを旅行しました。僕はミーティングをしました。えー、とジャあのアクティビストだと。Oh, I, I met with a Japanese American activist. アクティビスト。LT Pro in, in Los Angeles.、Okay. And、uh, some people in J Town in San Francisco. And, and, えっと、ですごく刺激を受けました。I was very much inspired. Yeah. えっと、全く知らない世界でしたね。It was unknown world to me. うん、だけど、すごく僕は、あのなんて言ったらいいかな、あのアプローチャーっていうかな、あのその親しみを持った。すごくさすっと入っていけたっていう。It was easy for me to get into that world. でそれが僕は年取りましたけど、いまだに。えー、例えば今サンドゼにいると僕はすごくフリーダム。ね日本に帰ると。When I go back to Japan, I feel this way. <笑>あのだからえっ、ー、とまあえっ、ー、とそそれでそのえっ、ー、と横浜カリフォルニアのレコードを初めて聞いたのは、so、えっ、ー、と六年前です。Six years ago. うんえっ、ー、と。名前は知ってたんですよ。よく名前が出てきた。うん。まあ、だけど、東京で初めて聞いて。で、すごく、すぐこう、あの、フィットしたっていう。I, I really、うん、I mean,、uh, the fear of sympathy.、Uh-huh. Yeah. だから、えっ、ー、と、例えば、タンフランにしても。あと、他の歌にしても、すごく、あの、えっ、ー、と、その。日系アメリカ人の歴史をそのまま伝えてる。It, they convey the history of Japanese and American music. I was impressed by the power of 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 the power Be a hippie sometimes, but、uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm here. 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 ジョアンノブコ宮本が彼女が日本をさまよってました一人で。She, he, she was in Japan by あのえっと彼女が佐渡島の古道に行って。So, he, she went to 佐渡島。あのあみんな古道。Head head quarters of Kodo。Kodo the drug。だけどそこから帰ってくるって。She came back。だけど彼女は。泊まるところがなくて There was no place for her to stay. で、うちに行きました。So、she, oh, she came to his house. あんだ、二泊三日して。Uh, two days,、uh, two nights she stayed. そう、ものすごく僕は嬉しかった。I was so happy. <笑>あの、それでいろんな話をしました。So、we talked a lot. で、すごく面白かったのは、あの、クリス・イジマ。What was interesting was、uh, about Chris クリス・イジマ。クリスは亡くなりました。She, he passed away. だけど、あの、クリスはニューヨークで育ってる。So、he grew up in New York. だから、彼は。えっと、いわゆる日系コミュニティじゃな,ないところですね。日系コミュニティ。だから、でだけどこの,あのツアーをしてたときに、このあのイエロー・イエローパウルであの全米をね、ツアーしてたときに、uh-huh. あの特にカリフォルニアに来て、でそのクリス・イジメは初めて、生まれて初めて、そのジャパニーズ・アメリカン・コミュニティにこうを接触する。クリス・イジメは、初めて、ジャパニーズ・アメリカン・コミュニティ。うん、だ,からだから僕みたいな日本人にとっては、so、その日系人日系人っていうのは一つの,一つのこうプレジディスがあるんですね先入観が。Oh, あのなんて
preconception we have a preconception mm. about Japanese Americans. Ah, so we have that about Little Tokyo. For example, yeah, that we think about a Little Tokyo. On that day, George Takei, that day. We think about George Takei. Eh, so that is very, so, 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 いろんなあのその various, 次元っていうかあの姿が見えてくる。Uh, different um, ideas, yeah. concepts about Japanese Americans. えっと僕は最初はベイエリアのジャズミュージシャンと親しくなりました。I became uh, uh, friends with the jazz musicians uh, And, uh, in Bay Area. They are so bad guys. <laughs> uh, I like like Mark Is. <laughs> 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 this is uh, the old CD, but uh, this is my favorite. Uh, this. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, Anthony Brown and uh, Francis Wong and John Chan, those bad guys, and let me into the, the strange world. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, but uh, Francis Wong was. Francis Wong. Uh, he was a student at Stanford. And he was a student at Stanford. He said to me, uh, when he was Stanford a student at the campus, in Stanford, in campus, in Yokohama, California, Yokohama, he saw Yokohama, California in Stanford campus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And uh, Steve knows uh, Francis well. Yeah, mm -hmm. no? mm. And Steve was uh, Francis. He, he did friends. And uh, you folks know the jury, jury Hatta. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, jury is a friend of mine also. えっとそれからあとはあのあともう一つもう少しだけあの皆さんあの日本にいるとあの日本は日本人だけじゃなくて日本あの日本日本にも多分六十年代七十年代ぐらいからえっと日本日系人それからエイジアンアメリカンただその時はエイジアンアメリカンという言葉は日本にはなかっただからエイジアンアメリカンというそのコンセプト自体がすごく僕には新鮮でしただ,だからえっと京都に有名なコーヒーショップがありますだから僕はアメリカに行く必要がなかったそれはアメリカに行く必要がなかった Garrett Hong and Alan Rao in Seattle and Lawson for Savinata. Those two guys, uh, Garrett Hong and Alan Rao, came down to the coffee shop in Kyoto and did some poetry readings. Yeah, <laughs> you don't have to translate. <laughs> <laughs> and still, two of them were my good friend of mine. I shared dinner together with Garrett Hong a, a few months back when he came to Japan. えっと、だから、えっと、それから例えば日本にはゲイリー・スナイダーもゲリー・スナイダーだからあと、うん、あと有名な、うん、あとえっとメあのメあのフェイマスバッサメンバーのビジュアルコミュニケーションズノッディウアフィクディウェイケンヨアアンえっとねヨコロイズ Bob Nakamura? No, no. Uh, his, his middle name is Seiki. Middle name is Seiki. 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 横浜カリフォルニアの CD が11月の6日に発売されます。Going to be released in Japan on November 6th. This is a Japanese flyer, and you can buy it at the ten dollar, but in Japan it's thirty dollar. I think it's too expensive, but it depends on Mr. Miyata at the Music Camp Incorporation. My my close friend of mine, but I wrote I and 僕は全部翻訳しました。I translated everything, everything. for them. それから日本語の解説も書きました。I, uh, a, a, だけど報酬はゼロです。Uh, I, I worked so hard, but then got paid zero. <laughs> <laughs> And that's hundred dollars, isn't it? Oh, but that's a CD is so, thirty dollars. Maybe I'm going to sue him. えっとこれはあのその同じ宮田さんの会社はミュージックキャンプから出た広島です。えっと came from the same CD company。あこれはもちろんアメリカで出た CD を日本で。あのディスプレイ。
dis uh, the distributed in Japan. And I wrote the Japanese liner notes for this. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned the uh, first time I, I, I let me speak Japanese, uh, English. Uh, first time I uh, <laughs> see uh, the Hiroshima play at the Os uh, at a big hall in Osaka city, and um, I was stunned because the, in the very first uh, opening in in a in the opening, uh, you know, the the Johnny Mori came by uh, with uh, Japanese kimono and. Uh, あの、それからね、えっと、えっと、助けてなんていうの。助けをかけるの。サッシ、サッシ。You so audience was kind of, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, amazed, amazed or... and upset. Upset. <laughs> <laughs> え、で、え、それであの、ここ、この日本のあの、解説にも書いたんですけど。I Oh, so the, the review on this magazine was horrible. Yeah. Criticized. Criticized horribly. It was only pretense. 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 It was only It's hard to translate into English, but it's kind of a pretense or fake or something. Yeah. あの、返事くれました。He え、すごく良かったです。to promote Yokohama California <laughs> to Japanese people. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. <laughs> it's okay with everyone. Stay up here. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. What I'd like to do, the final part of this, I have a question to ask all of the original panelists. And then, then if the audience here has any other questions and you're willing to stay, maybe we can answer a few more questions. Well, I just wanted so, to say one thing. Yeah. Um, um, you know, knowing Minoru Kanda, I think uh, to me he's one of the leading cultural ambassadors from Japan who is really doing a lot to bridge that culture and our culture together. And uh, for example, in 2012 I did a fundraiser raising money for the orphanage in Tohoku. And then one day, in the mail, I get this big check from Minoru. So, you know, all the way from Japan, <laughs> he's giving us money for us to give back to Japan. And, uh, 
You know, he's that kind of a generous person. I just also wanted to add that over 30 years ago, Minoru Kondo wrote about um, the Horikawa restaurant strike in Little Tokyo. My wife was organizing Japanese workers mm -hmm. in the Horikawa restaurant. You uh, worked on that article. And then you invited JA activists to yeah. Japan yeah. to meet Japanese activists yeah. uh, so that they could understand that Japanese Americans were organizing the Japanese yeah. restaurants yeah. here yeah. in the United States. Horikawa. This is over 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Yeah. That's how long he's been doing it. Yeah. That was the uh, first time I met a uh, Japanese American activist, uh, Lu Lucy. Uh, Lucy. Uh, no, Lucy. Mm. Yeah, I think having you here, it's, we're really happy you came because it does show at once the complexity of all this stuff. Because I think it's hard enough as a Japanese American trying to figure out, as you all talked about, who you are and going through this whole process. And then realizing that if you go to Japan, well, we're still weird. <laughs> But, we're, but you can see the work you've done is really respected. And so that's one thing, just for San Jose, that all of you here on the panel, Gary in Colorado. Um, it's in New York. Oh, it's in New York. Oh, sorry. It's in New York. Sorry. Um, well, time thing. Well, anyway, um, what, what I think is really important that I hope you all understand is that all of you have really valuable experiences and stories in you. You know, I mean, I know you're all accomplished and you've done a lot. But there's this other part that I would really like in here in San Jose in the museum to get at for the Sanse experience. And so hopefully this kind of got you going and you're gonna write a novel, a story, you're gonna do some more, <laughs> we have to do some more interviews, I know. But there's a lot more things to do. Um, and you know, we had an audience come here to, to listen, but this isn't really like a public program. I was just trying to get at some of the stories here and we can build on that. Um, so, I just want to express my deepest appreciation to all of you, and I know there's other people out there that would kind of get their stories as well. And to see that how other people, the other part of the world, appreciates this and understands the value. So I'm hoping that people here, right in our own community, can understand the value as well. Sometimes maybe we're the last ones to really appreciate what we have. Um, but to, and kind of the final part of this, I wanted to ask each of you if you could share with us, so what lessons did you learn from this time period and your involvement in the music or cultural scene that you think are important to pass on to the community and other people. And if each of you could just say a, a little bit about that. My whole experience with Yokohama, California certainly has uh, been one of those in influential factors in terms of the kind of work and um, calling that I feel is on my life. So coming back to work in the in the church community and it's really an honor and privilege to be able to come back home to San Jose, Japantown, which uh, feels home to me, uh, to serve this community and the, the church here. Um, you know, all of those, all that experience really is, is still uh, in a great influence on me and has brought me to this place. Um, Um, I, I guess for me is um, just looking back at all the struggles and everything, you know, sometimes it was really hard and sometimes it was great fun. Um, what I'd like to say now is, especially for the younger people in our community, is that you don't stop and go for your dream, basically, or whatever you think that may be. Um, because, you know, I think most of us were growing up, our parents probably were telling us not to do music or that wasn't a career. and. Mm -hmm. um, especially for me to become, you know, full-time taiko player or just being so involved with it, you know, that was not what my um, parents expected me to be doing or not what I expected to be doing naturally either, but um, it became my passion and dream and that's what I try to pursue and I just, I just want to say that I hope the younger people or other people just take on that challenge too, to uh, continue that, especially in the arts because we need more um, Asians or Japanese Americans, especially in the arts, to be showing, you know, what they're doing. Um, Peter. Hunting. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, um, I I did take some notes, and and one of the things I guess the lessons for younger people now is, you know, the in in some ways the community is so different than it was, you know, when we were kind of growing up. Uh, and 
that's actually one of the reasons why I, I worked on the Yokohama, California CD uh, to try to convert the album to a CD and, and look for other songs that we wrote and performed at about the same time um, is to kind of share that history with them. And I think it's along with the reason why you're doing what you're doing in, in having this panel discussion is, you know, um, yeah, even my own sons don't really understand, you know, what it was we were doing. And, you know, I mean, they've heard the songs over the years, but, um, you know, and, and it's not that, you know, they're not smart enough to comprehend, but mm -hmm. life is, is different for them than it was for us. Um, but I, I want to try to encourage them to, to tell their own stories and to, to find out who they are. And, and I think, like Rory said, you know, I think um, our generation, there was a lot of pressure to become doctors and lawyers and, you know, uh, accountants and professionals. And, and uh, you know, we, we did it a little differently. Uh, and and I, I feel that our community is better off for having done that. And I want to encourage the young people to try to do that as well. I mean, you, again, you look, you look around, you know, and you can see things in this community you know, that are the result of what the people of our generation did. Um, and, and I hope that the young people will, will take that cue and, and run with it. Okay, PJ. Um, I'm gonna go with Rory. Steve. Well, like Rory was saying, though, there's a lot of struggles back then. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have money. You know, now the kids have the internet and they, there's a lot of wealth out there and money and so forth. But, um, you know, for me, you know, I, I'd like to look at how we can use art and music for social good and um, how we can bridge the gap with other communities. And, um, you know, for example, uh, had the opportunity to work with the Vietnamese community. Last year was the 40th anniversary of the fall of uh, Saigon. And uh, I worked with um, Vanessa Bo, who, who produced a program um, at the Kennedy Center in honor of the 40th anniversary. And to learn from what their struggles are in their community and where they're going, I think, really enriches my life. And, um, I'm also working with the uh, Classical Chamber Music Group. Uh, we're working on a program, uh, a series uh, about immigration. And, uh, and then I also want to do a program about uh, uh, climate change and see how we can apply music and art to get the message out to people to take action. And so, you know, I'm all about working with as many different people, no matter what your background or your ethnicity or what have you, and to be able to reach out and take a leadership position, um, I think that's the message I like to carry to the younger younger folks. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's only two of you left, so one can come to the, oh, okay, you might to, Gary, New York, do you, what would, would you like to share at the end here? Oh, <coughs> Um, everyone have like good things to say. I just am um, oh, hearing my own voice. Uh, feedback. Uh, so I think uh, for young people, they should, if they have a passion for the creative arts, they should follow their passion and put everything into it. And I think something real good will come out of it. That would be my message. I, my own experience, I taught. Uh, four of our nieces, since we, and Nancy and I don't have any children ourselves, but I taught our nieces Tycho and Hines. Uh, one of them produces, helps, is an assistant producer for Warren Miller, the ski guy that makes the ski movies every year. And uh, the third is artist manager for a theater in Denver. So they all are involved in the arts and um, I can just say that uh, they played with us at Walt Disney World at Epcot Center during the summers and stayed with us and 
that little bit of influence uh, uh, helped form their lives, I think. Uh, one of their parents are very successful. One's a doctor, but none of the nieces wanted to become doctors. They were the, the poor, struggling artist. So um, that's all I would like to add. Uh, it was nice uh, being a part of this discussion, and then I uh, enjoyed meeting or seeing all, all of you that I can see. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Okay, DJ, no more hunting. Yes, no more hunting. <laughs> um, I think the arts, just in general, is about personal expression. To have a vehicle to be able to find your voice, to be able to share your story, to be able to create magic in the world, uh, to create healing. Um, I really feel that the, this is what the arts do. Um, I, I hope to extend that personal inspiration or that spark of that heart-centered feeling of expression and self-esteem and confidence and who you are. Um, I was able to use Tycho as my vehicle for self-expression. It's finding anything that really touches you. It's your passion. Um, and coming from community organizing background, it's kind of like taking from Gandhi, you know. Be the change you want to see in the world. So even though it's not all about me getting the joy out of it, is how how do my how does how do my actions actually ripple out for effective positive change? Um, are there any uh, comments? Anybody like to make any final comments? Yeah, uh, I guess a slightly different look at this. If we were to transport you from your youth in the 70s to today, where would you look toward um, finding yourself or organizations that would help you do that? Or what, you know, what path would you think you would take if you could imagine yourself being young today and trying to solve some of the questions that you're asking now, uh, of creativity, performance, and all that? Or do you, do you have any ideas? Uh, any of Well, definitely the internet is today, and uh, so if anybody's going to do anything in the arts or music, whatever, I think being involved in the internet, I think, is important. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the group Collaboration. It's um, um, If you go online on YouTube, they're one of the biggest Asian music uh, producers out there and uh, we had a chance to work with them about I don't know, eight, six, eight years ago or what have you and it's K, K collaboration, K-O, L-L, whatever, it starts with a K. Phenomenal artists there and it's just sort of this underground scene that I never knew existed and it permeates all the college campuses and but they have all the nice cameras and the equipment and you know there's affluence out there which we didn't have and uh, so technology internet i think is uh, where you need to be today well i would i would say that um, in some ways it, there there are a lot of opportunities for young people to get involved with uh, doing things in the arts these days because of organizations that we were fortunate to have created. Uh, and in some ways, it's, it's fairly easy to do stuff because um, as I found out in working on the CD, it's not really that expensive to create your own CD. Hmm. On the other hand, there's many more challenges because everybody can do that. So if everybody can do that, you're competing with everybody else, and you have to, you know, uh, figure out who you are and, and what kind of, of artistic, uh, you know, expression do, do you want to make, you know. But if it's in the musical area, you know, it is something that people can do, but you have to decide. It's still the biggest question is, you know, what what kind of music do you want to make, you know, what is the Asian American sound, what does that mean <laughs> for you, 
what does your sound mean for you? You know, and if you can figure that out, I think then then people will be more interested in that rather than you know if you do popular songs or something. You know, I mean, everybody and their brother and sister are doing that. You know, on YouTube and stuff. You know, but if you create something that's that's truly you, um, that's the toughest struggle. But I think that's really the way to do it. So I'm a little mindful of our time here because I made all of our crew here who are not getting paid anything <laughs> stay there. Uh, so I know this is just a starting point. Like, I mean, personally, I'd like to see more and more histories done. I know PJ and Roy, you've been interviewed by the museum and then show the group in Washington. But obviously some of you others have a lot more to say. And there's other people we know out there who we need to find. But that's just one tiny part because I'm real interested in community history. Um, clearly, we need a community program we can actually hear the music. That's I'm really aware of this contradiction that we're talking about music and we're not hearing any. Uh, so anybody here, anybody else who's attended today have ideas about a program? That would be wonderful. Um, so i just really like to thank all of you again for being willing to start up this process. I think it's a very important one to me personally and for our museum here as well. And I, I'd like to thank our technical experts, because I have no idea how any of this is done, so I'm totally relying on them, and they do all the work, like Dwayne Kubo and um, Kurt Fukuda. And um, if you could introduce your... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's Isaac Gatton and Chris Dahl. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to thank the museum for allowing this to happen. It went through a lot of different variations of what was going to go on, and they wondered what it was. Uh, but Mike, <laughs> Michael Sarah here is on the board at the museum. And, and where's Chris, Chris here? Oh, Chris over here. He's the one who does really a lot of the heavy lifting. So I'd like to thank them for That, as Peter Peter said and Minoru said, there are some CDs right there, right? You can put this down at <laughs> discount. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then if some of you are willing to talk some more, because you know there's probably a lot of questions and ideas people have. Um, but thank you all for coming, especially Minoru, and thank you so much for coming. Oh, my Thank you, Gary, for tuning in. <laughs> 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 what do we